What's up, Overflow? Can we give it up for King Jesus, who we sang about tonight? Can we thank the band for leading us in worship? You guys are awesome. How are we doing tonight, everybody? Okay, good, I wasn't sure, so that's great. Hey, um, how about last week? Was that last week not amazing? So good, y'all, it was so good for us, for me, I hope for you just to be back together again. This is week two of Overflow Fall Semester, and tonight we are going to be moving into a series of teachings around the person of Jesus and the life that he invites us into. And over the series, we're gonna be looking at the Gospels, primarily the Gospel of John, to kind of spend some time learning about Jesus, how Jesus lived, and what he invites us into. And so, I would love it if we can bring Bibles with us on Tuesday nights. Is that cool? Hey, it's, it's not like a huge thing. Like I'm good with like the Bible app, um, but there's something about having like a physical book in our hands that we can open up together and we can flip pages and we can look around. And so I would just in, encourage you, invite you to do that. Hey, if you don't have a Bible and we can help you with that, let us know at the Connect um, spot after, afterwards. We'd love to help you have a Bible. And so tonight, if you have a Bible, let's go ahead and turn to the Gospel of John And we're gonna um, kind of pick up right at the beginning of John, John chapter one. And so as you turn there, I wanna just kind of familiarize ourselves with the gospels. So we're talking about the first four books of the New Testament, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's the four gospels. And each of these four gospels is in essence the account of the life and ministry and teachings of Jesus. Each of the four gospels, is it's unique because each of them was written by a different person with a unique perspective of Jesus, right? And in fact, they're kind of writing with different purposes, and so they're all different, and that's the same for the Gospel of John. It's unique in comparison to the other Gospels because John had a very unique perspective of Jesus, right? And here's some of the things we know about John is that John was one of the disciples of Jesus, which meant that John was a student of Jesus. He was an apprentice of Jesus. He was one of the 12. Not only that, we know that John is considered to be one of the three. So Jesus had kind of three within the 12 that he spent more time with and had kind of even more special relationships with. Peter, James, and John. And on top of that, we know that John is actually known as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And he actually refers to himself as that in the Gospel of John, which I just think is so funny. I'm the one that Jesus loves more than everybody else. But when I read that, this is what I think. I think John was like best friends with Jesus. Like he had a front row seat to the life of Jesus. Like he knew the heart of Jesus. He had seen Jesus live out what he taught in everyday ordinary life. And so John has this really unique perspective from which he gets to share this gospel account of the life and the ministry and the teachings of Jesus. And near the end of uh, John's uh, gospel, he actually tells us why he wrote this gospel, which is uh, very, very helpful because in any kind of um, book or literary work, you wanna know why, right? The purpose helps you understand the meaning. And this is what John says, uh, you don't have to turn there, but in chapter 20, verse 31, he says that he wrote this, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. That by believing, you would have life in his name. In his name. That is the purpose of this gospel. And so as we read it, we need to read it with that lens that John is writing this so that we would believe in Jesus and by believing we have life in Jesus. Is that good? So what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna just jump in and we're gonna read. We're gonna pick up the beginning of the gospel of John. We're gonna read the first kind of section of uh, verses uh, one through 18 together. If you have a Bible, follow along. If you don't, we'll have it on the big screen Bible for us and you can follow there. This is what John says. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, we don't know who the Word is yet, but remember the purpose of writing this letter from John was that we would believe in Jesus, and in believing in Jesus, we'd have life. So we can go ahead and assume that the Word is Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. Verse two, he was in the beginning with God. It says, all things were made through him, And without him was not anything made that was made. 
In him was life. And the life was the light of man. The light, he says, shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. As dark and evil as our world is, the darkness of this world did not overcome the light. Verse six, there was a man sent from God whose name was John, not this John, not the beloved John, John the Baptist. Verse seven, it says, he came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, John the Baptist was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Verse nine, he says, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He, he was in the world, and yet the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, his own people, and his own people did not receive him. Verse 12, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So what we said last week, to be invited into the family of God. God is your father, us as siblings, brothers and sisters. Verse 13, who were born, these children of God who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, <clears throat> but of God. Verse 14, and the word, Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That sounds really good. John the Baptist, right, bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness, we all receive grace upon grace. And that sounds so good. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. No one has ever seen God, but Jesus has made him known. That's John's introduction to his gospel account, and those are God's words for us tonight, Overflow. Would y'all join me as we pray? Father, we come to your word and we come to these words found in the gospel of John and we, we ask God that you would unfold them before us. Even as I read it, it's kind of like, what is happening? But God, you have purpose in these words and I think you have a purpose in the words that you wanna speak to us tonight, God. So I just pray that you would come, that you would speak, that you would aliven our hearts, that you would open our eyes to see you, to understand and to enter in to this beautiful account of the life of Jesus. God, that's what we ask, that's what we pray. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, Overflow, I wanna know how many coffee drinkers do we have? If you're a coffee drinker in the room, yeah, some excitement, let's go. All right, if you're watching online, raise your hand if you're a coffee drinker, okay? Coffee, raise your hand again, I, didn't wanna, I wanna see you, okay? All right, cool. So most of us in the room are coffee drinkers. For those of you who are not coffee drinkers, have you ever had a cup of coffee? Like, do me like a half, half hand. Okay, cool. So most of us that aren't coffee drinkers, we, we've, we've had coffee before, right? Here's what I want you to do. And if you haven't had coffee, what are you doing with your life, right? <clears throat> Here's what I want you to do, is I want you to remember the first cup of coffee you ever drank. Okay? I want you to get it in your mind. I want you to see and imagine that day. And this isn't like you sipped your mom and dad's coffee. I mean, like you ordered a cup of coffee or you poured a full cup of coffee and you're like, you're going for it. Can you remember the first cup of coffee you ever drank? Yeah? Okay, did anyone take that first sip of coffee and they were like, oh, that's awful. Anybody? Yeah, right? Because the flavor is like, I was not ready for that. Like I remember, y'all, the first cup of coffee I ever drank uh, I think I was 14. I'm trying to remember, but that's a long time ago for me. But I think I was 14. And so I was like getting older. I was in my teenage years, trying to be cool. And I was with a friend, and my friend uh, was driving. I think it was a girl, but whatever. It wasn't like my girlfriend, just a friend, whatever. And we went to um, Caribou Coffee. Anybody know Caribou Coffee? Yeah, they used to be everywhere, right? <clears throat> Before uh, Starbucks was in Raleigh, we had a like, Caribou Coffee by my house. So we went to Caribou Coffee. And we go in, and I'm like, I'm pumped. 
I'm like feeling pretty cool. I'm in a coffee shop, right? I'm a 14 year old. And I didn't really know what to, to, to drink, but I'd heard the word cappuccino before. So I looked at the menu, I'm like, I'll have a cappuccino. So I get my cappuccino, right? Yeah. And I go over to the, like, the bar where you fix your drink, right? The condiments, the sugar and cream. And I'm like, I've seen my parents fix coffee in the mornings, right? They put cream and sugar in. I'm like, okay. So I'll go over. <clears throat> But my dad taught me, before you ever put any like condiment or salt or pepper on food, you should taste it first, okay? It's a free tip. Taste your food before you load it with salt. So I'm like, I'm gonna taste it. So I take a taste, and this, you know, friend of mine, girl's back here, I take a taste, I'm like, oh, that's awful. Like, who would wanna drink this? And I was like, what is this? It's so light, right? Because the cappuccino is right, half foam. I didn't know that, right? I thought like a cappuccino from like a gas station thing, whatever. No, this is like a real cappuccino. So I taste it, I'm like, this is terrible. Coffee's bad. So I start putting sugar, right? Come on, y'all know, right? Start putting sugar, I taste it again, still bad. More I mean, I am like unloading the sugar in this coffee, right? And I drink it, I get through it, because it was kind of a cool thing to do. Like coffee at that age, it's like, yeah, you're kind of supposed to start drinking coffee. It's cool, so I did it. And then I came to college, and college was like a whole nother world, right? Like you drink coffee in college to stay alive, right? It's like if you're gonna stay up all night to study for that exam that you knew about three weeks ago but you hadn't yet studied for, you gotta drink coffee or Red Bull or something, right? And so I started drinking coffee in college to like live, just to survive, just to make it through college. I had a roommate in college who was from up north and we were fixing coffee one morning or probably one night. He's like, dude, why are you putting cream and sugar in? I'm like, I don't, that's what you do. He's like, no, you drink it black. I'm like, okay, I'll drink it black. Change my life, y'all. Just try it, right? It's like all of a sudden you start tasting coffee, right? Instead of sugar and cream. And so in college, coffee was like survival. Like I needed coffee to live. Anybody, anybody with me right now? Okay. And then I graduate college and like whatever, you know, yeah. But I start going to like cool coffee shops. Anybody? You, you know, you go, you go home to Raleigh or you take a trip to Raleigh and there's a Jubala. You're like, ooh, this is nice. This is like really good. I don't need any cream or sugar and it's so good, right? And then Bespoke opens up downtown in Wilmington. I'm like, this is awesome. Give me that pour over of that mm, stuff. What is it? The hologram, right, Zach? The hologram, give me the hologram. And it's just like, I just drink a whole, they give you a whole pot. It's like, it's way too much coffee. It's so good, right? So I went from drinking coffee because I was supposed to drink coffee because it's kind of the cool thing to do to in college, I needed coffee to now, I just love coffee. And I'm not a coffee snob, so don't pin me for that, y'all. I like McDonald's coffee. It's good, right? It's just the flavors. And you start to experience like the subtleties and the notes, right? You start drinking coffee like it's wine. It's like, this is exciting and fun, right? It's the third wave of coffee. Here's the reality, y'all. I think the way that we approach coffee is not all that different from the way that we approach Christianity. I think a lot of us has lo have looked at Christianity from the outside in as something you're supposed to do, right? It's just a bunch of commands you're supposed to follow and rules you're supposed to keep. That's what a lot of the world around us thinks that Christianity is about. Or maybe you grew up in a Christian home and so your parents were believers, they're Christians, and so you're supposed to be a Christian. So that's just kind of what you did. You checked the box, right? Or maybe for you, Christianity is something that you need, like you recognize that there's a need there. Maybe you did grow up like learning about Jesus from an early age and like you're six and the Sunday school teacher's telling you like you can go to heaven when you die or you can go to hell when you die. It's like, well, which one do I really want? Right, we recognize like, well, we need Jesus to get to heaven, to get us out of hell and get us into heaven, to punch our tickets to heaven. I think for a lot of us, this is the way that we have viewed Christianity. This is the way that we have viewed the Christian life. This is, in fact, the way we viewed Jesus in the gospel. But I gotta tell you tonight that Jesus did not come to simply establish a religion. Right? Jesus didn't come to simply make you a better behaved, more moral person. And Jesus didn't come to simply punch your ticket to heaven to save you out of hell one day. I'm telling you, Overflow, it's way better than that, what Jesus did. It's way better. And I wanna show you right here, the Gospel of John, what we just read. Do you remember the first three words of the Gospel of John? If you've got a Bible, you can look. What's the first three words of the Gospel 
of John. Anybody, shout it out. In the beginning, in the beginning, John starts where any good story starts, right? In the beginning. But not just any good story, he starts in the very same place that this story starts. Genesis chapter one, verse one, the Bible, page one. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. John starts and enters into this story, this bigger story of what God is up to. And ultimately, this book, at its essence, is the story of God. It is the story of God's creation and God's redemption. At its core, what we believe from Scripture and what God has done is a giant story, the story of God. And if I may, I would love to attempt to, in the next couple minutes, give all of us, so we kind of all catch up, a spark notes, clip notes, summary version of the story. You good with that? It starts right in the beginning. In the beginning, God, right, he created everything out of nothing. And John uh, shows us that in the beginning, even at the beginning, Jesus, the word, was there. We also see that the spirit was there, intimately involved in the creation of all things. And at the pinnacle of creation, at the high point of creation, God creates us, humanity. Right? He creates us to, in some way, be reflectors of God, to, to bear the image of God in this world, to partner with God in the work of God. And the best part about it at, of all is that God actually created us to live in a perfect relationship with God. Perfect relationship. No distance. But that perfect relationship, we know this, it didn't last very long, right? Because what happened? Sin entered the world. When the first humans chose to disbelieve, distrust, and disregard God, which is my definition for sin, sin entered the world, and sin did what sin always does. Sin separated. Sin broke apart the perfect relationship that we are created to exist in. It created relational distance, social distance between us and God. Not because God pulled away from us, but because we turned away from God. The perfect relationship that we were created to live into was broken and separated. And although God would soon give all of humanity some commands and some rules to live by, we soon find that there's no amount of good behavior or rule keeping that allows us to earn our way back to God. And that's basically the rest of the Old Testament. It's just seeing failure after failure. We were giving a, given a set of standards, commands, rules, which were really meant for human flourishing that we constantly failed at. Even the heroes of the Old Testament, Abraham, Moses, David, failed, failed, failed. And what we see through the story is that nothing we could do could earn our way back up to God. And so, the New Testament, God comes down to us, amen, in the form of Jesus, the Word. The Word took on flesh, right? That's what John said. Better way to understand that is Jesus, the Word, took on humanity, and it says that he dwelt among us. He moved in and he lived with us. He moved into our mess, into our failure. The message says that he moved into our neighborhood. Jesus moved into our neighborhood. And why did Jesus take on humanity? So that he could once again make us right with God. Jesus took on our humanity so that on the cross, he would take on our sin, our faults, our failures, our separation, to pay the price of our sin, to forgive us of our sin, and to make us right with God. Once again, healing, bridging the separation that sin had caused. 
Jesus, the life, the light, the word, took on humanity, moved in so he could take on our sin and bridge the gap of our separation with God so that we once again could be and live in that perfect right relationship that we were made to live in overflow. That is the story of God. And that's good news, amen? And here, John, in 18 verses, y'all, this is incredible. In 18 verses, John connects the entirety of God's redemptive story to the very person of Jesus, the very person of Jesus. By using those three words in the beginning, he connects from the beginning of the story and enters us into the middle of the story where Jesus comes on the scene and connects the whole story to Jesus. And then just a few pages later, um, John um, captures what is probably the most comprehensive summary statement in the whole Bible. And we all know it as John 3.16, right? You don't have to know anything about the Bible to know John 3.16, right? John captures Jesus saying that for God so loved the whole world, right? The world that he created, the world that he made to live in perfect harmony and perfect relationship with him. He loved that world so much that he sent his son because he knew something was wrong, that something had been broken, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, would not die, would not experience that separation, that eternal death and separation from God, but would have eternal life, full life, real life. And we know that scripture, but what's so interesting about that scripture is that scripture doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from somewhere. And it comes from a conversation that Jesus had, which is one of the most unique and interesting and weird conversations that Jesus probably had. And it was with a, um, a religious ruler of his day, a guy named Nicodemus. You guys remember this guy? Nicodemus comes to Jesus late at night so that none of his friends would see him chilling with Jesus. And it's interesting because he comes up to Jesus. He's a well-educated religious elite and he comes up to Jesus and he calls Jesus rabbi, teacher. He starts a conversation with Jesus. He doesn't ask a question. And then Jesus says this uh, to this religious leader, this really well-educated man. He says this in John 3, 3. He says, Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus, this really smart guy, responds to Jesus just how you would and I would, so that makes us feel better. We're smart too, right? And he's like, wait, wait, wait. How can a person be born when they're already old? He takes it a step further. You might not say this to Jesus, but he's like, do you, do you crawl back into your mother's womb? And it's like, what? Come on, Nicodemus. Bad question, right? And Jesus is like, no. Because Jesus wasn't talking about a physical birth here. He's talking about a spiritual birth, right? He's talking about a spiritual birth, something that God was gonna do in you spiritually. And John actually already captured this in verse 12 of what we read. He said, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become, to become children of God. Jesus came to bridge the gap to repair the damage, but also to do something here, to allow us to be born again, to become children of God. Overflow, hear me say this, that Jesus did not come to simply make you a better behaved, more moral person. Jesus did not come to simply punch a ticket into heaven. What Jesus came to do was far better than that. Y'all, Jesus came to make you new. Jesus came to make you new, to make you entirely new, to the degree that he can say to Nicodemus that you have to be born again, that when you believe in me, that you will become a child of God. Spiritually, it is new life. Jesus came to give us new life a fresh start, 
to show us a new way to live and to shape and to mold us into an entirely new human. Jesus doesn't want to simply affect our life one day when we die. Jesus wants to affect our life today, right now in the here and now. New life today, right here, right now, right where we're walking. Second Corinthians 5, 17 will say it this way. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Currently, if anyone is in Christ, currently he is a new creation. Currently, the old has passed away. It has already happened. Behold, the new has come right here, right now. Y'all, Jesus didn't come, put on humanity, take in our sin just so that we can escape hell and get to heaven one day. He came to bring heaven into us today. He came to get hell out of us today, to live in a new life, a new way, to show us a new way to be human. And so if you come here and you've been kind of living in this mediocrity of Christianity, I kind of supposed to keep some rules, I know I need it, but kind of what's the big deal? The big deal is that Jesus wants you to experience new life today, a fresh start today, for him to do a new work in you and through you today. Y'all, the way of Jesus is ultimately an entirely new way to be human. And I don't know about you, but that makes me really excited because we live in a world and we look around at humanity and we can all recognize that things are jacked up that people are jacked up, that some of our friends are a little bit messed up, right? And then we look at ourselves and we're like, that's me too, I'm jacked up, I'm messed up. Jesus came to make you new. How does Jesus come to make you new? There's three things I wanna kinda point us to and this is gonna kinda carry us in through the rest of the series. How Jesus makes us new, number one, is that Jesus saves us. That's how he makes us new. Jesus became human to make us entirely new humans. He saves us. Number two, Jesus shows us. Jesus literally shows us how to truly be human. Jesus lived the perfect life that we all were meant to live but failed to live. He shows us how to live as a true human, the human we were created to be. And number three, Jesus shapes us. Jesus shapes us. He shapes us to become a human like him. Jesus actually does a work in us to shape and to mold us to look like Jesus, to live as a Jesus-styled human being here on this earth so that we return to our original design to be image bearers of God in our world, to reflect God in our world. Jesus wants to recreate you so that you reflect him. Jesus saves us. Jesus shows us and Jesus shapes us into the human that he created us to be. Jesus did not come to make bad people good. Y'all, he came to make dead people alive. And he doesn't just make us alive, he shows us how to live. And he shapes us into that life. And so tonight, there's a big thing on offer. What Jesus wants to offer you and me is new life. He wants to offer us a new way to be human. And what does that take? I think it takes two things. First, it takes believing. It's the point of John's gospel, that we would believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah. And by believing that we would have life, right? To step into this new way of being human starts with belief. It doesn't start with your performance, It doesn't start with your good behavior. It doesn't start with you following all the rules. It starts with you believing that Jesus is who he says he is, that he is the son of God, the savior of the world, the Lord, the king. 
There is nothing that you could do on your own to get yourself right with God. Jesus came and did that for you. And when we believe, Paul actually, he will say, believe into Jesus. That's the, that's the Greek language he uses. It's this investment in. It's that I'm all in on what Jesus did for me. And I received it. I received Jesus by believing in Jesus. And in that moment, he makes you new. It's the new birth. But it doesn't stop there. And that's where I think so many of us have stopped, y'all. We did the thing, we prayed the prayer. We would consider ourselves born again. And now we're just kind of like trying to figure it out, right? But Jesus wanted to continue to do something new in you. Show you what it looks like to be a human, to truly be human, to shape you into that. I think the second response tonight is simply to come to the feet of Jesus as a follower, as a disciple, him as our rabbi. That's what Nicodemus said. He said, rabbi, teacher, right? Y'all, if we, th if we think that we can live the Christian life without Jesus teaching us how to live it, what are we doing? Jesus wants to be our rabbi. He wants to be our Lord. He wants to be our master. He wants to show us the way and shape us into it. And that requires us to come to sit at the feet of Jesus as our Lord. So tonight, we're just gonna wrap in a time to just respond because we believe that uh, the time is now, right? We can tell you, hey, go think about something, but what about let's respond right now? I think there's some really easy, appropriate ways for us to respond tonight. Believing in Jesus, maybe for the first time, or simply coming and sitting at the feet of Jesus and saying, teach me. Teach me and shape me. Overflow, let's close our eyes. And we're just gonna give you a moment tonight. Man, the gospel story is so much bigger than we thought. It's not about getting us out of one place. It's about making us new, completely new from the inside out. And so tonight, if you're in the room and maybe tonight hearing this big gospel story of how our sins separated us from God, but Jesus came, what Jesus did is he lived the perfect sinless life we were created to but failed to. He died a sacrificial death, taking on our sin to pay that penalty, to bridge that gap. But y'all, he didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose from the grave so that we could have victory and life, real life, full life, eternal life that starts today. And so if you're in the room tonight and you are like, man, I've, I've, I've never really heard the gospel that way. I've never really understood about Jesus. I thought it was something I was supposed to do. I thought it was something that um, weak people needed, but now I realize it's what I need. And it's way better. And I wanna put my faith, I'm gonna believe in Jesus tonight. If that's you, just pray this prayer. You can just say in the quiet of your heart, God, I believe. I believe that Jesus is the savior of the world and he's the savior that I do need. I believe that my sin separated me from you, that Jesus' death paid the price for my sin and by believing, I made new. I'm brought into the family of God. God, tonight, I believe. If you pray that in your heart and you meant that, you are a new human tonight. God has taken you from death to life tonight. God has created a new thing in you tonight and we're gonna celebrate that in a moment. Or if you're in the room tonight and you're like, yeah, I believe, I trust, Jesus is my savior, but I'm kind of floundering right now and I need some hope. I think hope is found and sitting at the feet of Jesus as your rabbi, as your teacher. And so why don't you just pray and just say, hey God, tonight I just sit. I wanna see what it truly means, but means to be human by looking at Jesus, the perfect human, God, who took on flesh. Tonight I, I just commit, I surrender my life to follow Jesus as his disciple. I'm gonna let him be my teacher 
show me this new way to be human. If you prayed either of those prayers tonight, or if you just kind of followed along and something in your heart changed, God is working in you. And Overflow, as we take the next couple of weeks to look at what it means to be human, this new way to be human, and we're gonna see some incredible things in the life and the ministry of Jesus that are gonna radically shape us into some Jesus-styled humans in this world. And I can't wait to see what God does through that. Father God, we just, commit this time to you. We commit these decisions to you. We commit the things that you've done in our hearts tonight. God, we're so thankful for the gospel. We're so thankful for Jesus. And tonight we wanna celebrate that there is a new way, that there is new birth, that there is new hope. There's none better than you, God. There's none better. God, we celebrate those decisions. We pray, God, that they would be supported. And God, that you would grow this family up in you, together in unity, to look, and to talk, and to act, and to live like Jesus. That we would be the light of the world, because Jesus is the light of the world. Father God, we pray this. We believe it. We trust it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, Overflow, if you made a decision to put your faith to believe in Jesus tonight, your next step is to tell someone, okay? Find someone and tell them the decision that you made tonight, all right? Overflow, let's stand up. And we're gonna worship, we're gonna celebrate the God who came for us, who brought us back in relationship, who's doing a new thing in our hearts and our lives, even now. Let's go, let's sing this, y'all.